Xenoblade Chronicles X. An ambitious title released for the Nintendo Wii U in 2015, designed as the flagship game for Nintendo's newest console, featuring one of the most expansive world maps ever created. This game had a lot to live up to, and expectations were running rampant in the build up to its release, but fans were left disappointed to discover an unfinished mess with a narrative lacking any depth and ingenuity compared to its predecessor. Even so, being isolated on this ancient piece of hardware has left enthusiasts and fans alike imploring Nintendo to bring this title back into the limelight once more onto new updated modern hardware, now capable of supporting an adventure as vast as this one. In fact, next year will mark the game's 10th anniversary, acting as the perfect opportunity to reintroduce this game to the masses, mirroring what they did five years ago with the original Xenoblade Chronicles and its definitive edition. That being said, what many don't know is just how much a train wreck the development cycle for this game actually was, leading to a variety of changes being made, and much of the story that Takahashi worked so hard on being thrown out, all for the sake of half-baked features prioritising online compatibility over an actual functioning story. That's why within this video we will be attempting to uncover that original vision which Monolithsoft initially set out to create, possibly granting us some insight into the original story of Xenoblade X, or maybe even the next part of this narrative when aspects are combined with elements from Xenosaga to make Xenoblade Chronicles 4. But before we jump into all of that though, it's probably best that I present you with the full picture as to exactly how the development of Xenoblade Chronicles X unfolded. So of course, spoiler warning for Xenoblade X ahead, and if you've came from Spark Opus's video, feel free to skip to the timestamp on screen now, as you've already heard all of this once before. Xenoblade X's development began around the summer of 2010, pretty much straight after the original Xenoblade Chronicles had just been released. Takahashi approached Hitoshi Yamagami, the group manager of Nintendo's first EPD production group, and obtained approval for a sci-fi-esque Xenoblade experience. Like you might expect, production began with the team first brainstorming through different ideas, like a seamless open world and online features, allowing the devs to decide exactly exactly what game they intended to create, and what direction the series would take. Simultaneously, Takahashi also began writing up the initial draft for the story's plotline, including many elements that would make its way into the game and many more that would be cut later on. In fact, it's worth noting that both Ko Kajima, producer and director at Monolith Soft, and Yuichiro Takeda, fellow video game writer, both commented on exactly how much Takahashi wrote for the purposes of this story, comparing it to as if he was writing a novel. Given that Kojima has worked with Takahashi since Xenosaga Episode 1, his comment of this being the first time he's seen Takahashi write so much is quite significant, especially with the consideration that Xenoblade 3's early story was stated to have been drafted within this period of time. Regardless, after the initial script, idea and drafts had been completed, the team could set out to work into creating this vast adventure, but it wouldn't be long before things started to go amiss. Sometime between the summer and winter of 2012, the decision was made that Xenoblade X would go in a completely different direction. Instead of the more standard Xenoblade adventures that fans have all come to love, which was the original plan, Xenoblade X would instead become a pseudo MMO experience, all for the sake of utilising the upcoming Wii U's online capabilities. It's actually unclear as to exactly who made this decision, whether it be Nintendo forcing their agenda onto Monolith Soft or the devs themselves deciding to go this direction. As Takahashi has previously mentioned from as early as 1999 that he desired to make a game with online capabilities like this, but ultimately who made the decision makes little difference, as it was made all the same. From this point onwards, many elements from the game and its story 
were sacrificed and thrown away, so the development could focus on this new direction. What's worse, however, is that the team didn't really even seem all that committed to this idea in the first place, as they would later describe the online experience as being loosely connected to the player. This is actually the reason the current game has such a terrible online functionality, as the devs did the bare minimum to connect you with the outside world and other players, all the while spouting off excuses that they get shy when playing online games with other people. Effectively, what I'm trying to say is that the team botched together some lackluster online features and abandoned many of the core fundamentals that are now expected of Xenoblade games and JRPGs in general. Things like an actual coherent story, proper character arcs and development, as well as in X's case, the main protagonist, only to be replaced with a silent customizable avatar, meant to represent the player themselves. If all that wasn't enough however, in September of that year, Nintendo would reveal the existence of this project to the public, advertised as the game to wait for on the Wii U, leading to the requirement of an early game trailer to start getting fans excited for what was to come. Undoubtedly, this applied a considerable amount of pressure onto the team, especially after they just made the decision to pivot away from this initial vision. In fact, what they had made so far and what they were now planning to make were two very different games, ultimately leading to the original Xenoblade X trailer released on the 13th of January 2013 to contain very few of the online features that we would see in the final release, only displaying an MMO style chat box which was clearly being experimented with. Admittedly, this was a very bare bones build of the game, with only the most basic of aspects being implemented, and the game not even having a name at this point in time, only being known as X. Despite that, from here onwards, more and more of the original vision would be erased, as the devs gradually finished the game, and as trailer after trailer began releasing, we can start to see more and more of the Xenoblade Chronicles X that we all know and love up until the 29th of April 2015, where the game would release in Japan, and a few months later, the worldwide release would be completed, concluding the development of Xenoblade X. Before we move on however, it's also worth mentioning that this game's successor, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 for the Nintendo Switch, began development in July 2014 and was worked on alongside Xenoblade Chronicles X. What we can assess from this situation is that the majority of the game by this stage of development had been completed and that, for the most part, production efforts would be focused on finalising the last few details. Whilst the game we received received in the form of Xenoblade X is still a great experience on its own and is arguably one of the more better design titles in terms of balance and its mechanics, I'm still personally curious as to what the original story for this game entailed, and if it could have coexisted with the exciting gameplay implemented later on, maybe even using some of the more basic online features. Most of what we'll be taking a look at today is from the Xenoblade art book titled Art of Mira, showcasing many cut features, characters and aspects of the game which could give us an insight into Takahashi's original vision. We will also be looking at the first two trailers released due to the reason I mentioned earlier, as they contain some other clues into the original game. So without further ado, this is the original story for Xenoblade Chronicles X. As mentioned previously, before the game's direction was changed and Cross was implemented, Xenoblade Chronicles Cross actually had a protagonist of its own. Whilst no name was ever recorded, we do know of this character as the lone hero in-game. Once during the intro fighting back against the ghosts, and the second time during the Affinity mission we were soldiers, mentioned as Elma's comrade and an acquaintance of other Blade members like Doug and Lau. According to the art book, the lone hero was in their late 20s, making this the oldest Xeno series protagonist seen to date, and would have likely had many connections and ties to Japanese culture. Whilst it is never mentioned what his rank within the military would be, it is very likely that he would have been close to the top due to being the wielder of the original Ares scale, not to be mistaken with the Ares 90 that Lao steals later in the story, 
It was probably meant to serve as an effective true Monado or third Aegis sword equivalent for this game. As you can see in the side by side, both look incredibly similar as the Ares 90 was based on the original Ares scale, but there are some subtle differences. For instance, the original was actually a tandem scale, requiring two pilots to operate it whilst the 90 can be piloted single-handedly like most other Earthmade scales. This is why the lone hero needed a partner which actually turned out to be Elma, confirmed through one of the Xenoblade Cross short stories. If that wasn't enough, we may have also possessed our very own ship, known as the Dreadnought. Looking relatively similar to the Gilgamesh Veronis, used via the city in Xenoblade 3, with how its wings spread out, we highly doubt that we would have actually been able to use the ship and fly around in it, but it does feature a unique dock station for the Ares skill, implying that this would have been owned and used by our former protagonist. In addition, we can also see a sketch of what the bridge may have looked like. This largely looks like a carbon copy of those found in New LA's Blade Tower and on most Xenosaga ships like the Vokalinde. Lastly, for those vigilant viewers who were paying attention earlier, you may have noticed that in the early Xenoblade Cross trailers, most of the gameplay is taken from the perspective of a man with black hair who doesn't resemble anyone seen in the current game and we think it's likely to assume that this would have been indeed our lone hero protagonist. He even shows up in what looks like a pre-rendered cutscene that was removed from the game as our protagonist battles an Apica enemy within a scale. Considering that this event never occurs within the current game, and cutscenes like this aren't normally reserved for minor random characters, we think there's a good chance that this is the original protagonist as well. Additionally, we also possess concept art for a second Earth colony, specifically the Japanese Ark ship and its city, New Tokyo. Although it's still unclear to this day as to what the original purpose for this settlement was going to be. Perhaps this was going to be a second location that the player could find out within Mira, or maybe this was the original plan before the dev team changed the location to New LA. Even so, if it was the latter reasoning, then we're still unaware as to exactly why this change was made. Possibly to help this game appeal more to Western audiences, or maybe even to tie it in closer for his future plans. But regardless, in the grand scheme of things, there likely isn't that much of a difference between the two. That said, the original plan for this city was far more ambitious than what you may expect. Being in the realm of two to three times larger, and containing a stadium and a beach, acting as an entertainment or leisure district. Functionally, there likely isn't much difference, however, between the new LA that we got and the new Tokyo which could have been, as other than the majority of buildings being skyscrapers in the concept art, there really isn't all that many changes. It's also relatively likely that this decision was made fairly early on, even before the change to make the game more online friendly was made, as you can still see new LA in the first trailer, exactly as it is in the current game, excluding the giant gel spikes, that is. Now onto the detail for the real dedicated fans as we've got another cut character. This time, what appears to be a Shion Uzuki archetype in the form of Raina Sakuraba. You may recognize that name if you've played Cross before as Sakuraba is actually one of the arms manufacturers, which you can still play Miranium too in the game, also responsible for the manufacturing of the scales. Therefore, it's speculated that Reina for obvious reasons is related to the CEO of Sakuraba Industries, known in-game as Dan Sakuraba. Reina possibly could have been his replacement. Despite this, what we can say for certain is that Sakuraba would have played a far more crucial role within the main story, as it's speculated within the art book that she would act as a secondary heroine within the story, replacing Lin as the third party member who loves machines. In fact, there's actually even evidence to support this theory, as this first trailer displays an early rendition of Elma using both a minigun and a shield, the exact combination which Lin uses in the current Xenoblade Cross. In addition, whilst only for a few frames, we can see a third character alongside Elma and the lone hero, with black hair rocking the twin tail hairstyle. 
I admit this isn't enough to confirm anything, and maybe Reyna instead would just serve as an important side character, meaning that this may just be someone else entirely who was also cut from the game, but we don't think we can entirely discount the possibility either that Reyna wouldn't have been a second badass heroine within this game. It's also worth noting that alongside the new Tokyo artwork that we just discussed, we also have a depiction of a Japanese-style house labeled as the Sakuraba Residence, likely being the home of Raina and her family. Aside from the obvious resemblance to Jin's house from Xenosaga once again, the property's design is very interesting and hints towards the possible wealth and influence that the Sakuraba household may possess. Truth to be told, considering the likelihood that New Tokyo was changed very early on in development, it's very possible that Reina was ejected as well at a similar time, but perhaps that just means Lin's backstory and parents whom we know very little of may be somewhat similar, even if we don't know about it quite yet. We've talked about many different ideas so far, which sadly didn't make its way into the game. But how about one that just barely made the cut? The Black Knight. The mysterious hooded figure in Xenoblade Chronicles X, seen in the post credit scene of the game approaching Lao on the beach. Whilst in the current Xenoblade X he only receives his 5 seconds of fame, the original game seems to be a different matter entirely, likely being the main primary antagonist for the majority of the story, and our main obstacle. The art book once again references Japanese culture, with him wielding an authentic katana, but also describes him as possessing a different atmosphere compared to other characters seen within the game. It's difficult to know exactly how to interpret this as it could mean a variety of things, like his aura, describing him as a villain, or the pressure he exerts, suggesting that he is on another level of strength compared to other characters seen thus far. What's even more interesting is, like Goetia, the Black Knight seemingly was planned to wield his very own skull equipped with a giant katana as its main weapon, and the ability to transform into an aerial ship rather than a land-based vehicle. It's also noted to have been manufactured using technology far more advanced than that found on Earth, supporting the hypothesis that the Black Knight isn't human, likely instead being connected to the Samar Federation in some way or another. In addition, thanks to the notes left on the left side of those depictions, we can determine that the katana itself, as well as the right arm of the mech, are actually Rothian, likely taken after forcing the race to submit to the Ganglion, and in turn, Samar. For this reason, it's my belief that the Black Knight may actually be one of the last Samarians, the ancestors of the human race, explaining their similar postures and the continuation of Japanese culture into their designs, whereas the Great Ones may be someone else entirely. I wonder whom? Chances are that this villain would have functioned similarly to N from Xenoblade Chronicles 3, in the sense that they first appear around the midsection of the story, and whilst the main enemy villain would instead be Samar itself, they would still feel like the primary major obstacle that we need to overcome. On top of that, based on how detailed much of the artwork for this skull is, it's likely that very little of this was actually scrapped from the game, more so saved for a sequel that seemingly will never come. As for the final few cut characters from this game, there actually isn't all that much we know about them, but it's still worth mentioning all the same. Alongside Reina Sakuraba is another portrait of an elderly man only known as Dad or Father. For obvious reasons, we have no idea as to exactly whom he is the father of, and what their relevance to the story may be, but we can make a couple of predictions onto some of the more simpler details. Notably is the man's face and design, rocking a shortish beard and appearing to be roughly middle aged in their 40s or 50s. Considering that they also appear alongside other obviously important characters, it's likely that they would have been close to the main party in some way or another, potentially acting as a father figure to one or more of the game's characters. Personally, we like the idea that he would have been the first to have found Elma when she landed on Earth becoming her first protector and guardian, assuming the name of father from her. 
obey an adopted one at that. In which case, while still important to the plot, he may not have ever been physically seen in the game, instead being one of the many victims of the alien war and likely being left behind on Earth whilst being carried along in our heroine's heart. In addition, whilst admittedly far less important, there is also a depiction of a young girl named Emily, stated to have been the US president's daughter. There is in fact even less that we can speculate about her, but we do find it interesting that she exists at all. Whilst in all likelihood she was conceived as an idea during the planned area being based within America, we can't completely discount the fact she may have been present within the Japanese settlement instead, potentially adding a whole new dynamic between the ARC ships themselves making things be far more interlinked than they may at first seem. Lastly, our final cut character is a girl known as Neonail, belonging to the Calarium race, the same species as our beloved Selica. In fact, she shares this name with a couple of unique enemies, featured in one of the game's time attack missions, known as the Twin Dolls of Mystery, possibly some form of homage to the original character. Whilst her design is very similar to Selica, Neonail appears far more battle ready, wielding a pistol within its holster and seeming to carry a certain intensity along with her. Truth be told, the two are actually compared countless times throughout the art book, which is rather funny as Neonail is subject to being hidden within the spoiler section of the book, yet is still mentioned in many of the other comments surrounding Selica's artwork. Undoubtedly, the two were likely planned together when being designed, questioning why Selica made it in whilst Neonail did not, although the art book may give us that answer also. As it turns out, the Calarian people seem to have been planned to be far more important than what they are at present, as a variety of concept art images depicting a Calarian ship can be found. This would have likely been another race that you could have recruited throughout your journey, and likely would have had strong ties if Selica is anything to go off of. She's one of the only party members required for the main story, and even then, she only technically has one affinity mission where she's playable, compared to every Every other optional characters too. After being recruited, the Clarion ship, much like the Manons, would likely have been accessible and explorable through an elevator connected to the ship. Although it's unclear as if this would be some fancy techno elevator, similar to the Manon, or a more traditional one. I'd also speculate, and this one may be a doozy, that Neonail was actually originally the one intended to be a playable party member instead of Selena. She has by far the most artwork displayed within the book, with a variety of different designs and drafts, but most notably is that the version of Selica that we do see in Xenoblade X actually appears to have been planned to have had multiple outfits. Whilst a few other Xeno characters in the past have had a design change part of the way through the game's story, in my opinion, Selica simply gives off the vibe of being a non-combatant side character who is reunited with the Clarions and changes from her standard attire to something more traditional. I'd even go as far to say that she looks more regal, possibly being Clarion royalty, whereas Neonail would function similarly to Morag, acting as their closest attendant and strongest warrior. Either way, it's a shame that the Clarion race wasn't more predominant within Xenoblade X, as I'm sure they would have become a fan favourite within the community, also potentially explaining some of Elma's backstory and how Earth managed to acquire Treon technology, exclusively found from their home. Another alien race with content removed from the game is L, or whatever race you want to call them, they don't exactly have a name yet. Similar to the Clurians and Celica, L is one of the only alien races actually important to the core plot of the game even going as far as to be present during the current final battle against Luxar within the lifehold. Whilst most fans likely know this goofy smurf lookalike as a fun ball thirsting for knowledge, the art book tells a devilishly different story. In truth, Elle's actual form looks like this. 
A demonic figure with wings of flames erupting from his back. Despite appearances, however, it's likely that L and the race he belongs to aren't necessarily evil, and instead would be in a similar situation like the Machina from Xenoblade 1, as mentioned within the art book. If that wasn't enough, two other figures stated to be of the same race can also be seen with varying designs, one of which looking more insectoid, whilst the other is likened to a dark hero. What we find interesting here is how L always refers to himself in the plural, possibly meaning that these other beings may be part of L, or his race are permanently interconnected to one another, possibly even sharing a conscience or something similar. In all likelihood, L and his race were likely planned to be an early adaptation of Mobius or something similar. Don't get me wrong, there is still a plethora of differences between them as they're very likely not a concept, but there are just as many similarities. The most obvious of which is of course the name, L. It is a shortened version of El Sirufe, I probably messed it up, I think that's probably how you pronounce it. But the entire race may have abbreviated their name similarly. The idea of going between a relatively looking humanoid form to a demonic looking figure is the same, and if the entirety of their race were interconnected like we speculate, then that could tie them into Z as each Mobius is technically a part of him. They're definitely not the exact same, but they're still not completely different either. Making these guys an L Mobius 1.0. That brings us on to the Samar Federation, with a few extra details that we're able to scrape together. To clarify on the organization's structure, Samar is an interstellar federation spanning six light years worth of space. Meanwhile, the Ganglion are merely a small crime syndicate within their organization. To really give you a sense of scale, this shot during the intro displays the federation's mothership, known as the Rose Garden, and a metric ton of armed ships to battle the ghosts. The same ship, in fact, which Luxar is the commander of. That's right, merely one or maybe a couple of these battleships are actually what would be considered the Ganglion, driving home exactly how small a fish Luxar was within his big pond. The art bug grants us a better look at the Rose Garden mothership and is also where the name originates from, describing the surface it is made of as metal that resembles stone, with rays of light running through its wafer-like structure. In addition, artwork is also shown displaying a potential interior of the ship, possibly hinting that we originally may have been capable of entering inside, likely as a final dungeon area, similar to the world tree or origin. It's difficult to make heads or tails of exactly what this piece depicts, but we can just barely make out what appears to be some stairs towards the center of the piece, leading up to an altar, maybe even being the location for a final duel between the Black Knight and the Lone Hero. Other than this, however, even with the other few illustrations of related structures, we still don't know all that much about this megastructure and what purpose it may have served. So let's pray that time will eventually tell. Of course, the only topic we can follow up after the Samar Federation has to be the ghosts. And like always, we know nothing. Like, absolutely nothing. Sure, we can see examples of each individual type of ghost ship and can infer what their purpose and function within the army may have been, but we learn nothing about the race, not even what they look like. Learn nothing about the mothership or its structure and nothing about the goal of the ghosts themselves. Thanks to an incredibly talented translator, we can decipher some information surrounding their power source. Each ship being fueled via an antimatter drive, which is what leads to the ensuing explosions seen on the Earth's surface when they crash land. This is actually different to what most other scales, at least the Earth ones, tend to use, instead relying on a dark matter drive. If you're familiar with Xenogears and the slave generators, they were kinda like that with each scale having no onboard form of propulsion themselves and instead relying on energy that is transferred from a separate source. In this case, a literal dark matter engine, which was aboard the White Whale and is the topic of one of the Xenoblade Cross short stories. 
I mention this as it may mean that the ghosts are fundamentally different compared to other beings within this universe, relying on separate types of energy sources, but for now they shall remain a mystery. And that was every cut piece of content that we could find within the art book and the early game trailers. I'm sure there are many more details and aspects that were removed from this game that we'll never know about, as in typical Takahashi fashion, his stories are never simple. But now, it's time to piece together everything we've learnt so far, so that we might finally know how the original story of Xenoblade X would have unfolded. The original story would have likely began exactly the same, with us being introduced to both alien races fighting above the planet and scorching the land below, leading to Project Exodus being initiated and the White Whale fleeing the planet, up until two years later, where the ghosts finally caught up with them. I believe that this would actually serve as the tutorial for the game, teaching us the basics of ground combat and giving us an opportunity to pilot the Ares scale before it becomes inaccessible later on. Once completed, the White Whale would crash onto Mira, whilst our protagonist and Elmer, both within the Tandem Skull at this point in time, would land elsewhere. Similarly to how the second short story documented events, but this time the two would not be separated. During the descent, the Ares would lose power, likely having its own fuel source due to its unique design, forcing them to abandon the Skull and make their way home on foot, arriving within New LA. This would initiate a time skip to two months later, where the current Xenoblade X game takes place, allowing for the infrastructure to be set up within New LA and the game to continue as normal. There may even be a clever segue where for the past couple of months the lone hero was recovering from some form of injury obtained on the journey home, although I'm not sure how much sense this makes considering everyone is within Mimia zones. From here onwards, most things would play out similarly, with the search for the lifehold being our top priority, the discovery and conflict of the ganglion forces on Mira, a stupid potato following us home, and the introduction of many different alien races. In fact, most of the early game for X, outside of some actual interesting dialogue from the protagonist, would likely remain the same, and we may have even been reunited with Rayna by this point in the story, either acting as a third party party member or a helpful side character, thanks to her family's company. The first real change would begin to take place in Chapter 8, during the attack on New LA, introducing the Black Knight, who saves Riz and Dagan from being captured by ourselves and the party. Maybe he'd show up slightly later, but this seems like a fitting moment, and it always bothered me how Elmer just lets them get away, when capturing them could have provided so much more value, especially when you're sent out later to go face them once again, instead running into Selica. I feel this could even incentivize our villains, being furious that they were defeated by our hands and transitioning into the Zufog boss fight of chapter 10, actually giving the villains of this game some depth other than the stereotypical must kill all humans. Lau would still betray the group and attempt to sabotage our plans, but I imagine that it would be far more dramatic this time around, as our longtime war buddy would feel that we are directly responsible for the the death of his family, leading to an awesome fight against the Aris Skell, and a deep emotional moment once the fight is won, apologising for deceiving his friend. Slight side note, and whilst there is no indication of our protagonist's personality, I think it could have been really neat if our main character was trapped in a cycle of regret, trying to live with the decision he made or was a part of back on Earth, and this Lao section would serve as the catalyst of our protagonist growing above that and receiving the closure he requires, after being reprimanded by Lau. Furthermore, this would then lead into the recovery of the Lifehold unit, serving as the midway point of the game, and the completion of our first primary objective. With the Ganglion leader defeated, things would seem to be peaceful for a brief moment, before the Calarian race would arrive after detecting their very own Treon technology at work. Whilst the human race would attempt to greet them as normal, I picture that instead there would be some form of misunderstanding in relation to Selica and Rock, 
invoking the Clarion's wrath as they instead believe that it was the humans who attacked their home and kidnapped Selica. After a very polite visit to their ship and a slight bonk made to Neoneo's head, the misunderstanding would be cleared up, as the Black Knight would appear once again, this time equipped with his skull, requiring the combined forces of both the humans and Clarions to eventually drive him off. That said, the situation would begin to look dire once again, as we would then come to understand that the Rose Garden itself was coming for our heads, due to us defeating the Ganglion, technically a part of the Samarian Federation, spurring the leaders of New LA into action. This would be perfectly timed actually, to reinforce the Samarian threat now that the Ganglion have been defeated, pushing the story forwards and granting humanity a new issue that they need to deal with to survive on planet Mira. With the misunderstanding cleared up and an alliance forged, the Calurians would also settle within New LA, creating a council to discuss on how best to repel the incoming invasion, inspiring a certain somebody to also come clean. L would reveal his true nature to the party and provide the group with knowledge as to the dreadnought ship's whereabouts in exchange for something. Maybe access to more of Earth's knowledge or perhaps something along the lines of aiding his fellow comrades, those other demonic figures seen within the art book. Something along those lines that El would desire, leading to the introduction of his race and an agreement being formed. With that all taken care of, recovery of the dreadnought would take place and be interrupted by a boss fight granting us access back to the original Ares Skell and giving us a weapon that could finally match the Black Knight in combat prowess, setting up his defeat once and for all. As we enter the final chapter of the game, the Rose Garden would appear above Mira, leading to an operation of New LA's finest infiltrating the Samarian ship within the Dreadnought, whilst the remaining members of the Alliance bunker down and attempt to defend their home from the Samarian onslaught. Once on board, the Black Knight would confront us for the final time, in front of the altar that was depicted earlier, removing their mask and revealing their identity to the party. Like I said previously, I would presume that they would be one of the last remaining Samarians alive, but in addition, if the prior statement was correct, I'd also imagine that the Black Knight would resemble the lone hero themselves, with one or the other actually being their descendant. Ultimately, the conflict would still resume, leading to the lone hero once and for all using the power of the Ares to finally cut the Black Knight down, leaving the party and the player with more questions than answers. Shortly afterwards, the final boss fight would take place, likely being the Rose Garden's core or something similar, and being titled Omega. Because trust me, in one of the upcoming games, there's going to be a final boss with an adaption of this name. In a spectacular blaze of glory as the Rose Garden majestically explodes above Mira, ridding the universe of the Samarian Federation, our heroes would return to New LA to relish in their time of peace and tranquility as the credits begin to roll, but not before the silhouette of a man referred to as the Great One appears on screen and sets up for the second part of this story, concluding the the original narrative for Xenoblade X. Of course, for the purposes of this story idea, there's a lot that I've skipped over for the sake of making this video as digestible as possible, including lots of lore and other aspects from the existing game, but I find this original vision is far more interesting than the narrative we received within Xenoblade X, and I hope that in the near future, Takahashi returns to this story one way or another. Massive thanks and shout out to Sparks Opus and everyone else who helped me with this video. Go check out his channel and a link to his video will be in the description below. I'd like to also thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. It was a dream of mine to have a collaboration with another Xeno creator. So yeah, once again, thank you for having me, man. Let me know in the comments below if you've learned something new and which game you would have preferred, the existing Xenoblade X or this version. In addition, if you've enjoyed this video, please smash that subscribe button and notification bell so that you can stay up to date with all the latest and greatest Xenoblade content. I have many other videos planned for the channel and intend to get a few more guests on in the future, so stay tuned. With all that out of the way, we thank you all for watching once more and look forward to seeing you in the next one. This is JB, signing off.